Okay, so um, that was um, that was intrinsic evaluation of clustering. Can you evaluate clustering in and of itself? Now let's talk about how you could evaluate it extrinsically. So this is an example of using clustering as a pre-processing step for a classifier. Right. So, um, and this is uh, this is actually in common use when you do uh, when you do uh, object detection in images. So, uh, your task here is you've got a bunch of photographs and you want to detect presence or absence of particular objects in the image. So, for example, does the image contain a cat or does it contain grass or water, things like that. Right. So, as the first step in building any classifier, you have to represent your images in some way. And we talked about different ways to represent images. Right? Uh, in simple cases, you can just represent images as pixel values. Each pixel becomes a separate attribute, and you have a bunch of colors for that. Uh, but this would actually be uh, this this would be um, this would be pretty hard uh, here because your dimensionality would be huge for for natural photographs. You can do it for digits, which are you know twenty by twenty or sixteen by sixteen, uh, but you can't really do it for images. Uh, the number of attributes is too big, and the attributes aren't very meaningful. A single pixel isn't going to tell you much about the con uh, whether an image contains a tiger or not. Um, so what you would want is you would want a more semantic sort of representation of an image. So for example, if your images were tagged, right? So if, if they had something like that, if they had a bunch of tags associated, uh, then, then you could make infer inferences, right? You could, you, you, uh, it would, we know how to build classifiers on top of this representation. Uh, but we don't have that, and that requires human annotation. So what can you do? Uh, <clears throat> One representation that is used very often is, is this. You take an image, you slice it up into a bunch of patches, where a patch is just a little rectangular region, and then for each one of those patches, you're going to compute certain statistics, certain characteristic feature values. So those could be things like where is its positioned, what is its color distribution, does it have edges, how are those edges oriented, how does it respond to different texture filters, so does it look striped, does it look speckled. Uh, those are all things that, uh, that vision filters can tell you. So for example, this region right there, you could say that that uh, it's it's overall it's greenish. The hue is green. It has a certain intensity. Uh, it is not smooth, so it's going to have high response to textured and uh, speckled filters. Uh, it has uh, it doesn't have pronounced edges, but if they are, they're mostly vertically oriented. So all of those would be numbers in these uh, in this attribute vector, and you would have one of those attribute vectors for each patch in the image. Now, if you were just classifying each patch separately, you could just take this feature vector and use that as your representation. The problem comes when you have a bunch of patches and you want to put all of those representations together. And what you cannot do is you cannot just concatenate those feature vectors on top of each other. Why? Why can't you just concatenate? Why can't I just take a feature vector for that patch and, you know, if that is 20 numbers, then that's my attributes 1 through 20, and this would be attributes 21 through 40, and the next one would be 41 through 60. Which is why the patch uh, position, whereas the tiger can be in different places in the image. Okay, nice. So, uh, if you did that, this, we actually did this in tutorial 1, right? So, if you did that, that would encode the positions of objects. And uh, in a natural scene like that, that is not really desirable because uh, a tiger patch, you don't really expect it in any specific position. It could be anywhere in the image. So you don't want to tie it to a particular set of attributes. What you want to do is you want to do a bag of these vectors. That's, that's what you really want to do. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to somehow take this vector of features least vector of attributes, and represent it as, as, as a term or as a word, right? So ideally, you would want to say, okay, this set of features represents grass, right? And then you have a bag of labels like that. Except you can't have labels like that. You need humans to generate labels like that. But what we will do is we'll show how to generate labels that look kind of like that, right? So we'll, we'll have cluster number 27 represents these kinds of features. So that C27 will, be, will become our grass, except our algorithm, it won't know that it's grass, but it'll be the same C27 for all the images that contain 
grass. So how can we do that? And we can do that very simply with a k-means algorithm, because think about what you have. Um, I've got a bunch of images. Each image has a bunch of patches. Each patch is one of those vectors. I can take all of those vectors across my entire data set and cluster them. Right? So just clustering these vectors. I don't know how things are labeled. I'm just clustering patches based on their feature vectors. And what you're hoping for is you're hoping that across different images, similar looking patches will go into the same cluster. So if I have, uh, so cluster C79, it might attract uh, these uh, patches with a bluish hue, so patch like that or a patch like that, uh, that don't have much of a texture, don't have much in terms of edges, they're relatively smooth and sort of bluish in color. So all of them will get uh, into cluster C79. Right. And then all the patches that are sort of greenish in hue and have uh, vertical edges and are kind of speckled, maybe they'll go into C27, whatever, so 27th cluster. Uh, and then all the patches that are yellowish and black and have pronounced stripes, uh, they'll go into C14. Right. So see, what, see what's happening. This is completely unsupervised. I'm just taking each patch and based on its appearance, as reflected by the features that I've computed, I'm lumping some patches together. Right? So basically all the greenish things are going to be in C27, and all the yellowish and black things are going to be in C14, and so on and so forth. Um, and the reason you want to do that is this allows me to replace each patch, the feature vector that I had in each patch, with the cluster number. So the cluster number becomes a representation of that patch. Right? I no longer have all the pixels, I just say this patch, forget the pixels, forget the features, it is of type C27. It fell into cluster C27. Right? So, um, and that's what you would do. You, would then rep you can then represent your image as a bag of these cluster labels. So it will look kind of like that. That image, it has uh, four instances of C14, whatever C14 is, right? Uh, so C14 must be the yellowish and black uh, kind of vertically striped thing. And it has seven instances of C27, so those are greenish grass-looking patches. And it has 24 instances of C79, which is smooth, uh, bluish-looking patches. And, uh, and it won't differentiate between the water and the sky, but that's, that's okay, okay. All right. So. The point is, uh, you can use this to construct a very compact representation of your images. And having a compact representation is important because your classifiers like redundancy. They like to have lots of examples across a relatively small number of dimensions. And that's what clustering uh, is going to give you. It's going to give you um, lots of redundancy. Right? You're not dealing with individual pixels anymore, you're dealing with this coarse um, features. And that's, uh, that's, that's a sort of out of the box, if you were trying to detect things in images, that is a very reasonable first step to represent your photographs. And it's used all over the place for a bunch of tasks. Okay, so let's summarize where we are. Uh, we talked about, uh, about k-means clustering. Uh, it's a fast approach, uh, and the things that you need to remember is uh, it doesn't converge to a global minimum, it converges to a local minimum. What it's minimizing is the variance between the instances and the, and the centroids that they are aligned to. You need to pick a distance function. Euclidean is reasonable, but other things are good as well. You need to specify k, and if you, if you don't know what k to use, either use a scree plot and pick it out visually, or try to evaluate it. <clears throat> uh, and then another thing is uh, k-means doesn't guarantee that nearby points will end up in the same cluster. So that's a stable configuration and there's no way to get out. The way to get out of this is to run k-means multiple times with different initialization steps and then pick the one that gives you the smaller, um, the smaller uh, variance. <clears throat> and we talked about two, two ways to evaluate it. Intrinsic, so how good it is it in and of itself, and there you have the alignment or the pair-based evaluation, or extrinsic, that's basically, uh, can you use it to help something else? 
So can you use it to represent images and then run a classifier on those images, see how good your classifier is, compare the cluster representation versus the pixel representation, and then see was clustering useful uh, or not. All right, so that's all for k-means. Uh, we're going to switch um, to the EM algorithm now. 